811 voters. They were surveyed via live calls. And they got some inform- interesting information on a whole range of topics. Jason Uffman is the state director, and he joins us right now via telephone. Jason, good morning to you, sir. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me on. Great to have you with us. Uh, happy two months from Christmas Day to you, sir. Hey, as long as I don't hear any Christmas music before Thanksgiving's <laughs> over, I'm good. That just shows uh, you just chose your bumper music on the way out of this segment right now. There you go. <laughs> uh, let's talk about this survey first and foremost. What uh, um, was the reason behind the survey? Uh, obviously, we're pretty far out from the primary still. And uh, what were some of the more interesting things you discovered? Well, so I think, you know, first and foremost, obviously, most folks know, we've been on the show before, Americans for Prosperity is a, a principles-based policy organization. Um, and in the vein of that, one thing you have to keep in mind is that West Virginia is now really among the, the most deeply red states in the country, and that has the practical effect of meaning that really our, our primary elections carry a, a great deal more impact than, than do the general elections, right? So um, Republican primary voters have an outsized influence on not only who the leadership of the state will be, but on the policy direction of the state. And so it's really key for us to kind of have a pulse of where those folks are at on issues and so what we wanted to do was just kind of going into, uh, you know, what will be a highly competitive election cycle, figure out where, where folks are at on some of these issues. And I think, um, you know, what we found, not, not super surprising, um, given the state of the economy and inflation, Bidenomics, um, the result uh, probably, probably doesn't shock anybody, but 47% of Republican primary voters thinks that jobs and the economy, most important issue set facing the state, uh, and the second most important issue following that up was the drug epidemic at 7%. So everybody's focused on the economy. Um, Earlier this year, we know we saw uh, West Virginia enacted the largest tax cut in state history. Uh, Turns out Republican voters, big fans of that. Uh, When they were asked um, what they found to be the most important when it comes to government spending in the budget, 77% reduce spending in order to get lower taxes, even if it means some programs and services are scaled back. Again, that's, that's 77%. And so I think that's, that's pretty telling from an economic standpoint. Um, and you know, Governor Justice played a key role in, in driving that tax cut. 64% job approval rating for him uh, with 70% of Republican primary voters viewing as, him as favorable. So I think the, the lesson there is essentially, you know, when policymakers make a promise and keep it, their stock goes up. There were uh, also some questions asked about uh, who you favor for governor from the group that is uh, right now vying in the primary. Jason, what did you find out from there? Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, as folks are probably aware, we've endorsed Attorney General Patrick Morrissey for governor, and the observations that we had were extremely, extremely favorable for him. Uh, he leads the field for governor with 29 percent, uh, followed in second place by Delegate Moore Capito at 18 percent, uh, Mac Warner, Chris Miller coming in at eight and six percent, respectively. Um, 50 percent of respondents have a favorable view of Morrissey. Uh, only 29 percent of likely primary voters have no opinion or have not heard of Morrissey. That same number is 45% for Capito, 61% for Mac Mac Warner, and 70% for Chris Miller. So what what that last statistic tells us is that Morrissey has, more so than anybody else on the ballot for governor, done a fantastic job of getting out there and getting his name ID up. Uh, and that's really because he's just a standout when it comes to communicating with his constituents what he's doing for them in the office of attorney general. I mean, I'm sure you guys have had him on a ton of times. Mm-hmm. He's always in the news talking to folks about uh, these big national coalitions that he's leading as the attorney general to to fight back against federal overreach. I mean, whether it was you know stopping President Obama's war on coal, uh, West Virginia versus EPA, which was a hugely significant ruling at the Supreme Court that was led by Patrick Morrissey, um, you know, he has been out in front leading and, and winning. And so I think that's that's why you see those numbers. Do you feel that Morrissey also benefits from having already run 
Uh, statewide against Senator Manchin, plus two statewide elections for attorney general? Yeah, I think certainly. And, and another thing I'll say, Rob, is just, you know, he's taken the slings and arrows from opponents over the years. Uh, and he's he's kind of got a little bit of a Teflon effect going on, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, there have been a lot of attacks against Patrick Morrissey. And, you know, for his, his favorability rating to still be super high, his name ID still to be super high, I think people are going to have a hard time um, you know, diminishing the work that he's done on behalf of West Virginians. It's going to be really tough for them. Bill? Yeah. Uh, uh, good morning, Jason. Uh, you've given a insight into the recognition of the various candidates. Uh, what about the unfavorable rating? That, to me, is one of the key indicators. Was that included in the poll? It was. It was, yeah. Um, I, I think probably... Are you talking about in terms of the, the governor's race? Or oh, no, no, general? yes, for the governor's race uh, with the four candidates. You you mentioned how well they how well known they were, but did you also inquire about how unfavorable they were viewed? Yeah, I think uh, that that unfavorable number, you know, twenty one percent for Morrissey. Uh, I should also mention that it's the same for 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 Jim Justice. Uh, so it's it's a it's a pretty even playing field, I think, in terms of uh, you know. Looking through the rest of the numbers, more capita unfavorability, eighteen percent. Again, that's that's because not a lot of folks know that name. Um, just to give you a register, Joe Biden's unfavorability in West Virginia. Take a wild guess. Seventy-eight percent. I have the survey. Three percent. Yeah, let's see, I have the survey in front of me, so I knew the answer. Yeah. It's overwhelming. <laughs> How much I did was not. it? Seventy-three. Seventy-three percent. Okay. I said seventy-eight. Yeah. I was close. Very close, yeah. yeah. You were you were close, and Rob, Rob, thank you for not cheating. Uh, you're, <laughs> you're, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. It's not seventy three percent; it's ninety three percent. Yeah, Jason, ah. would it be fair to say with a fairly low unfavorable ratings for all the candidates, there'd be adequate room for growth as he as it become better known? Well, I think certainly. I mean, you know, we're seven months out from election day. And there's going to be all kinds of conversation had. Um, I think that one of the biggest points in this, uh, there's a lot of undecided voters. Um, and there are, th- those folks are up for grabs, right? I mean, I think. What's the, what's the percentage, to, Jason? Do you know? Uh, total percentage undecided, um, 27%. Okay. 27%. So there's a lot of people that just haven't made their mind up yet. I think also one of the things that has been interesting for, for you know, people that pay close attention to politics in the state, uh, I'm not sure that West Virginians are are super clued into this thing where primaries matter more than the general. This is really only the second election cycle where that that has been the case, right? You're going to have a hotly competitive primary election, and then the general is going to be kind of a snooze fest. I mean, there's not going to be a whole lot going on. So... Um, I think as we continue sort of down the pathway of the state becoming more and more red, um, folks are going to clue into that. Maybe they'll start paying attention to the election cycle earlier. Probably not. A lot of folks just haven't made their mind up yet because they're like, oh, yeah, there's an election next year. Sure, we got to go vote, right? And that even includes likely voters. So, yeah, it's fair to say there's a lot of folks up for grabs, which is why, you know, obviously – um, for our purposes, as, as folks who've endorsed Patrick Morrissey for governor, um, we're out knocking the doors and, and talking to folks uh, at the doorstep about these issues and, and the fact that Patrick Morrissey is the, the right guy to lead us into the future for West Virginia. Jason, there's, if I memory serves, this is at least the third poll. Uh, Marcy won the first poll. The second poll that was released was won by Moore Capito, and now uh, the one by Americans for Prosperity, the third poll, uh, which uh, has Marcy again in the lead. So two of the three Marcy leads, but one more Capito won by a sizable margin. Is this just a... Uh, uh, Poland procedure, Poland error, or has there been a surge of Marcy lately? Do you know? Um, I think that probably, you know, some polling's better than other polling. Uh, not not throwing shade at anybody, but all I'm saying is uh, essentially, you know, live calling is the best when it comes to trying to register the contentions of voters. Our poll was a live call with 
a very significant sample size, so I have a high degree of confidence that it is accurate uh, as of you know the the date it was taken. So it's done October third, October fourth. Uh, I, I would point out though, and I'm a firm believer in this. It's all, it's kind of trite, but the only poll that matters is on election day, right? And there's a lot of time between now and, and election day, and so for these candidates that are that are running for governor. Uh, it's just going to come down to uh, really candidate quality, I think, is a big factor now where folks, um, those that, that are clued into the fact that the primary election is, is where the real action is, are looking for very quality candidates. They want a person that has demonstrated leadership, that, that has proven track record of going out and winning for them. And that's, again, why I think Morrissey's kind of got head and shoulders above his, his competition. Maria, do you think, Jason, that and and I get that um, that folks come out early, announce early because, um, you know, they want to lead the pack, what what have you. But is there some concern then that there's just kind of voter fatigue by the time, you know, by the time the primary comes around? It's just kind of like, well, geez. We've been hearing about this for a year and change already. And, um, you know, again, I get why people come out early, but it feels like it's just earlier and earlier every um, every election cycle. But then again, there are 27 percent who are undecided. So um, she's got to uh, inform them somehow. Correct. Yeah, I think, well, the, the reason that you see things start stacking up earlier and earlier uh, is because of the level of competition, I think, that, that happens in West Virginia primaries now. Um, Makes sense. We're benefited sort of by the fact that we're you know not like a presidential battleground state. Our primary isn't like a Super Tuesday primary or one of those early state primaries where I think folks are really, really inundated um, with, you know, electoral politics. Sure. Uh, but, you know, we always got to remember there's states like Virginia that, that – essentially have an election cycle every year, right? In yeah. Mississippi that have off year elections. So I, I think that we're you know, if you if you take sort of from an empirical scientific standpoint, you look at those states and say, is there a lot of voter fatigue there? Probably more so than here. Um, but but again I think that the competition um, is what is driving it and that, that undecided number, right? Everybody has internal polling and they see how many votes are up for grabs out there, and they go, well, I guess we got to start talking to those people, and that takes time. Sure. Jason Upman is our guest here on the program. He is the State Director of Americans for Prosperity uh, West Virginia. There are some other interesting points in this poll, too, including 61% of uh, respondents backed open enrollment for schools, 67% backing school choice, Self-described very conservative voters, 76%, and urban voters, 90% are the most likely to support school choice when compared to other ideologies and urbanicity groups. Likely, West Virginia GOP primary voters strongly prefer lower taxes and less government services over more services and more taxes. 86% of very conservative voters hold this view. Moderates also prefer lower taxes by a 63 to 23% margin. When it comes to government spending, 77% of respondents indicated that policymakers should reduce spending in order to lower taxes, even if it means some programs and services are scaled back. My question for you out of that information, Jason, first and foremost, were they being surveyed on federal spending or on state spending or all government Hmm. spending? Uh, Well, I mean, the question was, was general. It was when it comes to government spending and the budget which is more important. So I think it it probably could apply to both or either. Um, Yeah, I mean, that that, that was the verbatim question that was asked, and that's how people answered it. 77% reducing spending in order to lower taxes, even if some programs and services are scaled back. I'm wondering, one second, Marie, if you don't mind. I'm I'm wondering if people in this state really understand (laughs) how much federal money keeps this state propped up and I'll tell you this, because Mike Cornby, who owns the place, is a delegate. And the state budget is four point whatever billion, almost $5 billion. But there's $9 billion in federal money, all told, that flows into this state for a variety of reasons, right? And if, if the people surveyed got their wish, I cannot imagine for a second the amount of increased poverty in the state of West Virginia 
if those who wish there was less government spending got their wish. And I don't know how the rest of West Virginians who pay taxes would be able to support the people who rely on those federal funds for whatever reason. I don't know how you pick up that slack. Well, let me let me push back on that slightly, Rob. Please. So when when it comes to, you know, the quote unquote war on poverty, we we spent trillions of dollars on that over decades and decades. And yet we still have poverty. Oh yeah, lots the, of it. The, the only real mechanism that we know that is a historic proven policy uh, to lift people out of poverty is free market capitalism. It's it's lifted eighty percent of the world's starvation level poverty out of poverty since the 1970s. Um, and so I think when it comes to that, that spending question, what, what especially in this current environment people are looking at, they're looking at inflation. They've seen, you know, the federal government in particular uh, spend like drunken sailors, and they know that is rising their bottom line in terms of consumer goods and services. Their dollar is worth more, or sorry, worth, worth much less as a result of that, that increased spending. So I think there's the, the things are not mutually exclusive with regards to economic prosperity, but also having a social safety net for the truly vulnerable. And so when we, when we go down the road of looking at, you know, federal entitlements, yes, but even at the state level entitlements, there's a means by which, and, and I think probably a, a practical way to provide that safety net for the truly vulnerable without breaking the bank. Well, Does that make sense? We had the pastor of the rescue mission on yesterday, Tim Garino, and I think we could all agree in this room and on the phone, Jason, that the Eastern Panhandle is the most vibrant economic part of the state with incredibly low unemployment uh, and uh, standard of living is high here, right? But Tim Garino said here in the Eastern Panhandle, the moment that the federal government reduced and eliminated the SNAP benefits and the TAMF benefits, I guess that was left over from during COVID. The next day, basically, the rescue mission was overflowing with people in lines because of now the lack of food, right? So we are both free market capitalists, Jason. We're on the same page on that one. But if you take that spending away, I'm telling you, the guy that runs the rescue mission says he sees the immediate effect of it. And what picks up the slack are the good-hearted people like, Bill Stubblefield and Maria Lawrenson, who then take bags of food down to the rescue mission for the people who can't afford food anymore, even in a place as vibrant as the Eastern Panhandle. Go ahead, Maria. Well, I was just going to say, I think that we often use those words, federal spending, state spending. But if we came down to it, if we said, how would you feel if you're... Um, Social Security benefit or your Medicare benefit, you you suddenly don't. Um, you know, you look at the demographic of our state, um, somewhat elderly population, present company included. Um, but you look at that and you say you use this broad term of federal state spending. But then if you drill down and said Social Security, Medicare, those things that come along, I think people would um, would perhaps have a different opinion about that. I'm, I could be wrong. I don't know. But I'm thinking solely in those terms as opposed to um, others. Well, and I, I think an important thing to point out is, you know, we're, we're the second or third oldest state. I think Maine is number one, right? And so the vast majority of respondents that were asked this question are, are likely, um, you know, not young folks. Uh, and so I think part and parcel to that, it, if you find the result surprising um, when they're asked, you know, even if it means scaling back services, reducing government spending is important. I, I would I would point to the sort of the elephant in the room, which is, you know, thirty three trillion dollars in debt. Mm-hmm. Right. I think that sure. folks are looking at that number and the effect that it's having on inflation and saying we've got to be able to do something. Obviously, at the federal level, entitlements comprise a, a considerable amount of the, the spend. But, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff that the federal government is spending money on that if you went through it with a fine-tooth comb and we stopped uh, budgeting, you know, on continuing resolutions and, and bad deals that are made in bad faith uh, at the 11th hour to avoid a government shutdown, I think the, 
American taxpayer gets a better deal overall. So I think what what I see when I look at that particular statistic uh, from respondents is they just want some fiscal regular order to happen. They want to see a, a budget, and they want the federal government and the state government to have to do what they do at their kitchen table, and that's balance their books. I think we can all agree on that, at least. Bill Stubblefield. Well, yeah, we can agree, but it depends upon whose ox has been gored. <laughs> yeah. uh, each, uh, if you went through the budget and fine tooth comb, half of us would say at least a third of projects being funded or should not be funded. It depends upon who is looking at it. I think this is kind of a paper tiger. It's, it's an argument easy to make. We need to do it. Uh, going back to the uh, uh, continuing resolution, I agree with you 100%. The longer we wait to do our, uh, get our budget house in order, the more mistakes are being made and the more people that have been suffered uh, that will suffer. So, uh, uh, so there's two or three of these arguments that may have some correlation, but they're independent uh, arguments uh, in their own right. Jason, well, I think that, that, go, uh, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Likely GOP primary voters in West Virginia split in the direction of the state, 49% indicating satisfaction, 44% indicating dissatisfaction. That is surprising to me when I see that because these are GOP primary voters and with the GOP uh, supermajorities, I would think that more would be satisfied with where the state is, which uh, seems to be trending up and in a pretty good direction with uh, an income tax cut just passed and still uh, mounting budget surpluses. Jason, any idea why that's such a lukewarm number? Well, I think that folks are just wanting policymakers to go bigger and bolder. That That's what I take away from that, especially if you look at you know, the, the same folks that were polled, 92% dissatisfied with the direction of the United States. Um, so if you take them in, in parity and in, in contrast, uh, that's a lot more folks that are very satisfied with the, the direction of West Virginia, almost a plurality. Uh, but I think for the folks who are dissatisfied with the direction of West Virginia, of these likely Republican voters, it's most likely that they, they want lawmakers to keep going um, You know, with these policies that they've identified uh, that they agree with. Um, you know, for instance, uh, reducing taxation. Um, we got a historic tax cut. I think many West Virginians uh, that are likely GOP primary voters would say, yeah, that was a great tax cut, but we should go further. And so that that's where I read in between the lines for that that dissatisfied number. I'm just I'm just wondering if many of them let their dissatisfaction with the federal government spill over into their into opinion the of local yeah. government. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Any effect on that, do you think? Oh, yes, certainly. I mean, I think, you know, what what does James Carville say? It's the economy, stupid. Yep. And so (laughs) I think that definitely is is at play in this cycle in a very big way. Did you have a final question, Bill? Yeah, as a technical question, and uh, and – Perhaps I'm mistake going down this route, but I'm I'm interested in that American Prosperity is a nonprofit. Uh, as a consequence, you do not have to disclose uh, the benefactors, the donors, uh, as opposed to PACs, political action committees, which you have to disclose uh, who the, the donors are. What makes uh, how, can you apply for to be either a nonprofit or a PAC? Is this done up front? What distinguishes? How, how does it determine which of these two routes you go down? Uh, that that's a good question for my lawyer, Bill. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, seriously, I think it's it's really all down to the those are IRS designations, right? Um, and so five hundred one C four is which Americans for Prosperity is. We're a social welfare organization, policy advocacy. Um, so that's that's what we do. Uh, super PACs, on the other hand, I think are more 527s uh, under IRS designation are more politically driven. Their donors are disclosed because they're spending on uh, politics. And five, 527s, that's that's kind of their express purpose. Whereas 501c4s, I know people's eyes are glazing over, uh, but 501c4s are social welfare, welfare organizations that uh, can do lobbying, which is what we do. Jason, good to talk with you again, man. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thanks for having me on. Jason Upman, State Director, Americans for Prosperity, West Virginia.